the, the, the thing for that to happen is that needs to be a decision in D.C. that China is the biggest priority. And do you think that is the view in Washington? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we said pivot in 2011 and we said rebalance in 2012 and we said TPP and we said all these things. And well, we didn't actually do anything, did we? So, no, I guess not. I'll take that back. <laughs> I mean, I do, I do feel like under the Trump administration, there was that obviously a major shift in per the perspective on how to treat China. And the Biden administration has largely carried on with that same philosophy. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, so for sure. Um, but I don't think I didn't spend a lot of time talking to my friends in DOD about this. I mean, DOD continues at pace. Right. But during the Trump administration, we ended up dealing with, um, you know, other things, although compared to what happened after Trump left, and as far as things bubbling like invasion of Ukraine and, and uh, Afghanistan and the rest, things were pretty calm. Uh, but we still had a hard time making the shift from UCOM 2014 in the Middle East, CENTCOM, uh, into PACOM. I, I'm not saying we didn't go backwards, but didn't really go that far forward. We did make some uh, progress on North Korea, again, which I had no real you know, hand in, but I thought that went well. You know, North Korea was pretty calm you know, for that time, even, even with the Moon administration, which was problematic, as you realize. Um, I mean, look, we've got Yoon in Korea, and we've got uh, Marcos in the Philippines. I would have given my eye teeth for that because I had to deal with Duterte and Moon. That was tough. Yeah, it's a very, very different situation over there now. Um, but this is interesting. It seems like there's there's so many different conflicting things happening. Like I, I know some people will point to, you know, the U.S. is in, in investing a lot of money in Ukraine. And now with the Israel-Palestine thing, there's that's a focus now. Um, and this is really dividing U.S. energies. And, the, you know, some people are saying, well, this is the perfect opportunity for uh, China to come in and take Taiwan. But from everything you're saying, with China's economy going down the toilet, uh, with, you know, not anything resembling a real alliance between China and Russia. It, it, it just kind of seems like everything is falling apart. And that's good in the fact that, like, China wouldn't be, might not be able to invade Taiwan. But maybe they also want to invade Taiwan more now because they need the nationalist fervor. Yeah, well, so that is what some people are, how people are analyzing this, that, that, that things are becoming more likely that an invasion will happen. Right. I'm in the camp that they have no interest in invading when you've got a January 24 election that they are doing a pretty good job on influence ops there. I was there in Taiwan in August and we were talking about that. And, and look, Taiwan is on the leading edge of dealing with Chinese disinformation, you know, China Radio International. I was watching CCTV4 in, uh, I think I was in Kaohsiung at the time. And um, they were, had this expert. I love how they tread out these experts. You know, sometimes they're Westerners, you know, useful idiots. And sometimes they're uh, mainland Chinese folks who claim to know a lot of stuff, even though they are locked down on information. But this expert's talking about how the U.S. is selling um, substandard stuff, the F-16V. Uh, the delivery is so slow. And the, F the J-20, their uh, F-22, is far superior to all this stuff. What I found interesting is that the Taiwan actually let CCTV put that out there because CCTV-4 is Chinese language programming for external consumption. That is not the message they're sending inside. The message that they're getting inside China is CCTV-1. Have you guys ever seen CCTV-1? Yes, unfortunately. It is this anodyne recitation of what Xi Jinping had for breakfast and then who he met with next. And if you were to watch CCTV-1 in Taiwan or here in the U.S. and not CGTN, you'd go, oh, whoa, 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 I get it. I see. Yeah, this is right back to the Soviet Union. Uh, the cult of personality, uh, completely disconnected from reality. This is pure propaganda. Uh, and so one of my goals would be to get not just Taiwan, but the U.S. to bring CCTV one into American homes. And so you can look at that. And maybe you guys can do that. Maybe get some clips with Li Keqiang, you know, and we know what the reality is. And here's how the Chinese propaganda machine is putting it out there. That would be it's actually interesting with Li Keqiang's death. I was looking at Chinese state-run media websites this morning because uh, the news just broke. Because we're recording we're this on Friday. Friday. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, the news just broke. So, it's interesting that, you know, Li Keqiang passes away, even in their external English language media, is like tucked away into like a little corner under giant headlines about Xi Jinping hosting some like an important regional meeting about something that's in like, you know, font that's like 30 times bigger than the Li Keqiang is dead thing. And it was just. 
interesting to kind of have that visual reminder of of uh, what the priorities of Chinese propaganda are. Well, replay Hu Jintao's unfortunate dismissal from the 20th Party Congress. And remember when Xi Jinping kind of looks over at the security and gives him the, <laughs> cut it. As Li Keqiang's walking out, he looks down, I mean, as, as Hu, Hu Jintao's looking out, he looks down at Li Keqiang. And Li Keqiang kind of like carefully looks at him and you can see there was something there, right? Like, we can't allow this sort of thing. Um, so I, palace and tree, you can imagine there were some undercurrents. And you're seeing that too, the the reports from the Japanese media on the friction at Bay Daiha, right? Where the, uh, oh, what was his name? The retired Ch- uh, general officer. Zeng, uh, are you thinking of Zeng Cheng Hong? Supposedly no. leading like this criticism of Xi? Yeah, yeah. But anyway, it was of that nature. And everybody's like dismissing the Japanese reports. But I think there was a lot to that. When he has run the economy into the ground, when he's become this unpopular, when the CCP is no longer, you know, uh, any uh, as popular as is flagging. You got to imagine that they're, you know, whatever the Shanghai clique is doing these days is really starting to go, hey, we need to change this. We need to change the leaders. It's, you know, 10 years is up and he's still here. We, we, he's going to continue to destroy our economy and, and our position in the world. So all these things point to a, a problem that in, in the past, death of Stalin, you know, what we've seen in the Soviet Union has resulted in some kinds of purges. I mean, Mao was purged in 1960 or 1961, right after the Great Leap Forward. Then he came, th- you know, roaring back in 66. But yeah, even Mao was purged. So I can see Xi Jinping getting the, the boot here. Well, the, the Mao coming roaring back, like the price of that was a decade of cultural revolution, which was one of the most destructive things in, in Chinese history. Like, I mean, it was just terrifying. But you, so, have, you have these power centers and these cliques and, and it's funny with how they treat their uh, senior leaders. Uh, you know, again, the Russian sense, they die of what deceleration sickness, like falling from a building uh, or poisoning. Uh, but the Paris is comparatively gentle with their the folks who've fallen out of favor. Like Deng Xiaoping was rehabilitated twice, right? He was sent down to the country uh, or three times, but he's, he was sent down at least twice, but he came back. So uh, Mao was sent down, but he wasn't necessarily, I mean, probably house arrest at, at worst kind of held in reserve in case we need him again. And they, they allowed him to come back. So you can see that happening here coming up with Xi Jinping as well, I think. Uh, I think he's done enough, uh, he's made enough of a mess of things that it wouldn't be surprise me a bit if uh, after Li Keqiang's death. Have you seen the protests online? Because remember, Li Keqiang was like, he was like a grandpa Wen Jiaobao. He was revered because he was a counterweight to this heavy-handed communist thing. It's, yeah, it's interesting because people don't really know a lot about Li Keqiang. Like I, in the New York Times obituary, like uh, announcing his death, they even said like we could not confirm his survivors. Like it was weird because uh, they were uh. just like, like he has he's he's got a wife and a daughter, but like I couldn't find her name online. Mm-hmm. But um, I just think of him as the GDP guy. Yeah, I think yeah. like. Li Keqiang is kind of a blank slate for which people to hey, kind of pro- all of their dreams. Yeah, project their dis- dislike of Xi Jinping onto, right? Like it's kind of like the classic Chinese you you uh you know, praise other people's kids in order to kind of like <laughs> shame your own kids. So like Xi Jinping is in power and like now Li Keqiang's dead and Li Keqiang is like the best ever because we we don't like Xi Jinping and what he's, what he's doing. Well, he was a counterweight, um, and that's why I think he fell out of favor. But it was nice that the Communist Party picked his counter, his his successor with a similar name, Li Chang. So that you know that's very helpful. On that note, and then I think you guys can help me out on this one. Uh, if you look at the sacking of Li Shang Fu and uh, uh, Qing Gong, you know Qing Gong was Xi Jinping's hand-picked boy, right? He put him in D.C. and then he brought him back. Uh, these things all seem related to me. I, have you guys talked about that much? We have um, the the kind the take we're kind of doing on that right now is because with um, Li Shangfu, Qing Gang, and also a lot of the Rocket Force people, like those are all those are different types of purges than we've seen before. These were all Xi's people, uh, like the he basically built the Rocket Force into what it is today. Xi Jinping did. Um, so, kind of the analysis that we're taking on this is is you know Xi Jinping has sort of used. Uh, corruption and national security to go after purging a lot of his political opponents in the past. And now sort of his enemies are using that kind of language to force Xi's hand to go after his allies, which uh, weakens his position, makes him look 
unstable at best, particularly in the West, where, you know, it's 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 really reading as Stalin vibes right now. Uh, so that's kind of how we've been looking at it, that, um, yeah, this is not necessarily something she wanted to do, but was kind of forced to do. Right, which means that he is not the single power source everybody thinks he is. I mean, Definitely he is, not. He's made a lot of changes, going from nine to seven for the standing committee and all those things. People, again, the whole reason Hu Jintao was, when he opened that folder, he realized none of his people were on the standing committee. Uh, brings us to Leo Hu. Uh, we're talking about the economic and trade deal, and I hate to digress from the Russia thing, but maybe uh, Leo Hu in the, Seven, uh, 19 actually came away with a peace in our time document that was going to end this trade trade friction in the U.S. finally standing up for trade friction. And he gets back to Beijing and Xi Jinping, there's no way we're not going to sign up for verification regime me- mechanism. That, doesn't that agreement still exist? It just hasn't been executed. Like the Chinese walked away from it. So, you know, my advice to anybody in the current process that cares to listen is to stand, uh, dust that agreement off. Let's just go back to that agreement on the economy uh, that had a verification mechanism. In it. So when they did walk away from it, there would be substantial penalties. So this might be a way to quickly, uh, you know, hold Xi Jinping's feet to the fire on things like trade. 